Welcome to the Automators Podcast with your host, Jackie Stook and Joe Glines. In today's podcast, we're going to cover 13 tips how to hire the right automator and limit your risk. Yeah, it's going to be great. Come and check it out. Hey, everyone. It's uh, Joe Glines here out of Dallas, Texas. Yeah, and Jackie Stook here from Copenhagen, Denmark. And today we got a pretty fun, interesting topic. Uh, it came about where we're talking about 13 tips, how to hire the right automator and limit your risk. And it came out because on one of the Facebook groups, um, someone had hired somebody and then they noticed uh, unauthorized access to their Amazon account, which perhaps that was probably the, the thing they were trying to get automated. And, um, you know, he had been warned about the, the risks of giving someone your credentials and things. So, we thought we'd build a list and we've broken the list into three different sections. There's the before you hire, the terms of agreements, and then the limiting risk once you've made a decision. So let's jump into this um, with the before you hire. Uh, now, the very first thing, and, and it just sounds silly, but I can't tell you how important this is. Write out a very clear description of the process that you want automated, because no matter what, if you want a good price and you want to be very clear and not waste people's time, it has to happen at some point. So Write it very clearly out what you want to have automated, the tools you're going to be using, the software you're going to use, clarify if it's going to run on just your computer or other people's computers, you know, things like that. Some of the context, the operating system you're going to run on, like these are things that can really help people understand and give you a really a good, accurate price. Yeah, absolutely. And, and simply, the, the, uh, you should really emphasize on writing it out because yeah, you, you might have thought it through. You, you might be able to explain it in a video, but the, the person making the automation for you will have a much easier time of giving you exactly what you want if you have been able to actually formulate it on in text. And I'd say the second one is to ask them for three references of past work. Right? It, it's, it's a big thing. I know at least that I've had a hard time of hiring people because, hey, what type of work have they done? Are they able, how did it go? All that kinds of stuff. So I'd say absolutely ask them for references. It's, it's a great thing. It, well, it's so important to actually say, like if they can't give you three, we'll call them customers, but it could be, you know, whatever, how you want to phrase it, three people that, that you can talk to that will vouch for you right? Like then something, you, you probably don't want to work with that person, or at least, you know, what it boils down to there, find someone else that does have three people, because it shouldn't be that hard to find three people that will vouch for you, right? Uh, now, number three, we're sticking with the threes, there is three, refer three, three references. And the third point is three examples of their actual code. So find three examples of stuff they wrote. So you can get an idea of really like, you know, just to look at it, it doesn't mean you have to understand it but they should be able to give you kind of three things that they've done to help you understand if they're qualified or not. Yeah, and I'd say those two can kind of work together. If someone is quite new and you like to hire them because you seem, they seem nice, they seem confident, uh, you can use three examples of their prior work and maybe a single reference or three reference and a single piece of their prior work or stuff like that. But I'd say, um, you can also ask your uh, experience on different approaches. You know, uh, I know Joe, he, he used uh, and has made something before where he tells you 17 methods of, um, that he has outlined that you can use to all that stuff. Um, yeah, so there's um, like com objects and DLL calls and send, sending keystrokes, right? So... Yeah. See, right. see how many of those that they have used, right? And they're familiar with, because if they only have one or two, it doesn't really even matter what one or two it is. If they only have one or two, that you, you want someone really robust, at least has five of them, I'd say, right? Like they don't have to know all of them, but just at least they have more than two. Yeah, exactly. Because if you can look at their prior work and you can, you might not know that much yourself. It really depends, but if you have an idea that you want them to automate a web experience, uh, when looking at your prior work and what they have done is text manipulation. And that's the only type of work you, you 
get restrooms from them. Yeah, you, you, you might ask them for some different examples or if they don't have any in that aspect, you should be wary, right? It, it's just uh, a, a thing to keep in mind. Uh, I'll take the fifth one here as well. Ask what kind of guarantees they'll provide uh, that the stuff they do will work. Right? It, it's like, yeah, if, if you agree for them to do it, I've had a couple of experiences where it's just installed. It's, it's taken a long time for them to finish or deliver. And uh, when they then did, it didn't really work. And then I wasted my time. They probably wasted their time. So yeah, some kind of guarantees that the stuff they'll make will work for your case. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so now we've finished up with the first section. I'll switch to the terms of agreement. Uh, now this gets to like, you you know, hey, you're, you, you've basically qualified the person, right? Now you want to get a feel for how are you going to actually work with them, right? So one thing like who, who are going to pay for the updates? Now, depending on what you're doing, if you're doing a web scraping project, first, you know, for example, uh, typically what I say, hey, if, if what you paid me to do, you know, out of the box, I go to run it and like today you go to run it and it doesn't work, that, that's on me, right? Because it should have worked and the chances are their web page didn't change. If it did change, that's not my issue because the website at some point is going to change, right? So just nailing down exactly how does that work and, in you know, what fees are going to be involved um, to make it clear. Again, a lot of this is just being very clear and upfront with people because if you get that stuff out of the way at the beginning, your relationship and everything, the expectations are so much better. Yeah, because as you said here, the, the first one for the terms and of agreements is who will pay for updates. But it, it's a matter of you delivering something that works with the web page uh, or whatever it is at that time. Uh, because the second one is the timeline of delivery, where you should agree on some kind of delivery date. Well, how long do they need to finish it? And if you're the one doing it, or if you're hiring someone else to do it, getting that down because when you have delivered and that agreement has um, uh, been done, whatever you call that, you have actually delivered the product. From there on out, it's a new thing, right? Then there, it worked at that point. And even if it changes on Monday, you might need to make a new agreement. Uh, so, so yeah, absolutely. Timeline of deliverability, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a critical thing. And the other one that which actually I, I thought about as part of that is when you're outlining what process you want done. And now, granted, maybe you're not a programmer, so you can't do this. But sometimes, and you can work with them in this part and say, can we break it up into like kind of modules where that way um, we we don't have to. I don't have to wait till the very end to decide if you're doing quality work or not, right? Like we can have some, you know, first level. Uh, I know with Isaiah's he'll for creating GUIs, he does a, what's it called? Um, a mock-up? Yeah, a mock-up with, um, and there's some other term, I can't remember what they, they used at TI, but it's basically, so it's a mock-up with frames um, and, and you can kind of see the layouts and stuff. And you don't have to wait until the very end to, to decide of like, oh crap, I'm screwed, right? Or, and again, it protects both of you, right? Because you want to get that figured out early. Um, yeah. The next one is, as you're doing this stuff, like who actually owns the intellectual property that you're creating? The the code itself is probably yours, but if they're you know using libraries of stuff in that code um, because they've already you know done a lot of the stuff before, which is really a really good thing, right? That means it's been tried and tested. Um, chances are you don't own all the actual code inside it, right? But that program that you actually create, you know, maybe make it very clear that like you're not going to go sell sell the thing I made, paid you to create something for me, and then they can't go out and sell it also, right? Which would be terrible. Yeah, exactly. Like it's, let's say you had a great idea of some way to help um, a company that um, finds a driver for you when you wanna go somewhere and you, figure out a great way of going out and doing some automations in their system, whatever, whatever. 
you don't want the one you hired to actually take that and go and <laughs> rework it and sell it to the actual company or whatever, if that was your plan. So yeah, uh, I'd say one of the things that I've had issues with is also, are there any fixed or tra tra transactional fees uh, within this agreement that you have? Um, I'd say those can be all kinds of uh, things. It can be, I know uh, you, Joe, with emails and stuff like that, that mm -hmm. will often be some kind of fee for sending a given amount of these. And is it your account that's being used or is it theirs? Do they want that expense to be covered in some way? That's something you should also agree upon before uh, taking so that you don't get some kind of unknown bill later in the process. Yeah, yeah. Um, especially like the API calls, right? Some API, a lot of APIs are free. Some of them charge you per, per transaction, and just you want to make sure you understand that at the beginning, because uh, it also will change the design of what you're actually doing. I mean, maybe there's a way you can get ninety percent of what you want without doing API calls, and there's no transactional costs, right? So it just again, it's good to get this stuff flushed out. Um, a really big one, of course, too, is uh, point five is when will you pay, right? And typically what, what I usually ask of people, especially if I've never done business with them, is give me a little bit of money up front, you know, depending on how big the project is, maybe a little bit of money in the middle and a little bit of money at the end, right? Um, or maybe a, a, a quarter at the beginning, a quarter halfway through, and then 50% when I finish everything, right? It just depends on how big the project is. But generally speaking, most people, especially until you've done several transactions and you know, work with them, breaking it up is smart. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a great way. And it, for both parties, again, you don't want to be the one sitting there and, and doing a lot of work, uh, working for weeks, perhaps, and, and ending up not being able to get the agreed upon amount because, because whatever. Right. And so, so it's better to have maybe something up front or something set uh, along the way every week or every time you make a, a delivery of some kind. So, yeah, absolutely go with with the, with an agreement upon how the payment will happen. Let me chime in here before we, because I know you got the next one, but it, the, all this reminded me of one thing that uh, I'm a landlord, right? And we, we constantly hire vendors for doing stuff. And there's a saying that we always talk about contractors that they're always great until they're not. It's basically, you know, everyone <laughs> starts off good. And then at some point, some, they just go to shit. I mean, they, 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 they don't deliver. And so even when you have a long-term relationship with someone, just remember, like, you got to keep in your back pocket. You can't overly trust them too much, right? Because so always have a little bit of skepticism. But well, I know it works the other way too with the clients, because I know from talking to you in the past, you've had some clients that have owed you money and then they just kind of disappear, you know, yeah. even though you deliver what they say. And up before that, they were great, you know, paying you. And then suddenly they just disappear, um, yeah. So sorry. It, it, it's really a, a weird one. And often it's been uh, with the hourly fees, right? Where the, the, the next one here is also about that. Do you want an hourly fee versus a flat fee? Wh which one are you going with? And for a long time, I read and was told that until you really get to know yourself, your skills, the different tasks you take on, go with the hourly because that's where you have the most chance of getting paid for the time you use. That could be more meetings with the client, explaining whatever, it, it can be all kinds of different things where if you don't charge by the hour, the chance of you in the beginning charging wrong is really, really high. Whereas if you've done it for some time or if you're doing the same thing over and over, you, you get a much better idea of what to charge where you still leave room for making um, that uh, extra uh, win when something goes uh, a bit easy. Now, I'm going to 
100% agree with everything you say, just said. However, I'm going to throw a little caveat in there because when you do switch, when you're working with someone and you're paying them first by the hour, or they're paying you by the hour, let's put it that way, and then you switch to a flat fee, it changes people's behaviors on both sides, right? Mm -hmm. Like your incentive. So suddenly the client, if they're paying a flat fee, they want to have meetings all like you'll never seen, right? They want to make all these changes that you never planned on. Um, and, you know, that's because you just agreed on a, a basic fee. And so you have to figure out some way, if you do have a flat fee, to, to very well plan out. So that's point number seven. You know, how are you going to handle changes to scope um, and new ideas or just crazy times and meetings that they want to have and talk your ear off, right? And give you background and stuff that's not relevant. And that's all your time, right? Like when you're a flat fee, it's, it's, it's going through my mind of like, you know, Never mind. I won't say it, but um, it, it's just some some people just like they just keep talking, talking. Yet when they're paying by the hour, I still don't want honestly nine out of ten times want to hear it. But at least I'm being compensated for it. Yeah, yeah, it, it makes a little bit more sense, right? The, it's fair enough that in some cases a flat fee might be fine, at least if it's a smaller thing. But it's, as soon as it gets um, more scope. The only one is the safer one to go by. Um, so, so yeah, because as you said yourself, if, if the client changes the scope or if you're the one hiring people, mm -hmm. you might feel that the flat fee is the nice one, but it might not be fair for the one that you actually hire if you are the one who keeps getting new ideas or them showing, see here, I made what you asked me for and, and you're like, yeah, isn't it a little slow there? Couldn't you do that different? You know, it easily takes off with uh, with those. And yeah, you, you know, you just brought up an interesting thing of like, and I don't know how I would put it into the paperwork kind of the deal, but there is a question about how fast and reliable is it going to run, and and not that you would have a hard metric on it, right? But um there should be something written in there about like the speed, you know, it's going to be working at, I think would be a good one. And the, the likelihood of it crashing, right? Like um, some way to account for those two factors. Yeah. And, and that's kind of the, the first one we had uh, where you have what kind of guarantees uh, do yeah, fair enough. will work in a specific way and stuff like that. So, yeah, we, we do have some things in there, but yeah, you, you can always go, but that step extra because if you actually have uh, a speed need or uh, it needs to be able to run at a specific guaranteed success rate or whatever yeah stuff like that could, yeah or, or be at least faster than a human or at the same speed as a human whatever time frame that is right it's depending on what you're on you you might need it to run be, between midnight and seven o'clock next morning and it, it should work uh, nine out of 10 times or whatever, uh, or be able to make a great log if it doesn't or whatever it might be. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, which part of that original one also would factor in like, what happens if it does crash? Do you Are you expecting them to have built in logs of understanding what, you know, what went wrong and where and debugging? And is that part of the overall, you know, pricing? Because that's extra stuff that, that as a developer, you have to put in there but if you're getting paid, you know, for the flat fee, chances are you're not going to add that stuff in there, right? Unless someone's asked for it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, I'd say it kind of goes into the last one also, uh, limiting your risk once you've made a decision. But it, it, it's most of this is kind of that. It is trying to limit uh, how many uncertainties there are, how, how high your risk is. Uh, and because the, the example we started with here was someone who had their Amazon account accessed without their approval, um, create a test account and use that uh, or something similar. Um, because in most cases, you can either make a, a temporary email address, or you can make another alt account for whatever, if it's a game or if it's something else. There's often no 
reason to use your main only account. There can be cases where that's the only thing you have. If it's in a work environment and stuff like that, you might not have the ability to create other accounts, but then there's other things you can do. But yeah. Yeah. The, the, yeah. Like one of the other things you could do was, would be to limit the data they have access to and, and even create fake data, like data, data that does, isn't actually have the, the customer's PII information in it, right? Um, create some, some dummy data that this way they can have access to the system but the actual data they're using doesn't really give them any insights and any any privileged information, right? And that's something often you can do, um, and, and it's not a big deal. Um, the other one is uh, if if you can't easily create a test account, have them remote into your account. You take care of entering the passwords and username, right? And then you have them remote work on your computer, and that way they don't have your credentials, and you can watch everything they're doing. And what I also actually I would throw in there is have a recording of it, right? So even if, you know, no matter what, record it the whole time and you can always go back and watch it later. Yeah, I've, I've had this with the hires before where they'll be working on to set the, the outline process of all of that and um, all the different types of, of stuff like that. And with these uh, intermediary uh, deliveries on the way where we would have a test session of the stuff that they had done, where, yeah, we would go and have a shared uh, whatever meeting, Zoom, Teams, whatever, and it would be happening online with the delivery that they made where they tested against uh, the live system uh, in, in one way or another, but where we did it together on my computer, which in some cases where that was needed, that made a lot of sense because I was locked in. I had, I wasn't allowed in any way to share the credentials I had anyway. So that was the only way. Yeah. And it was um, uh, a registered uh, device. And so I couldn't have shared the login with them anyway because mm. whatever device they had wouldn't have been right. allowed on that network. But yeah, so, so that's a great one. And I'd say the third one here in limiting your risk is if you have to give them credentials and it's credentials that is yours, try and change them first. I've, I've done this to my own website before, before support has come on from a company I've, I've bought a plugin from or whatever. I'd change my credentials. I'd, I'd keep the name or the email or whatever it was but I wouldn't give them the actual password that I use daily. Right. I'd change the password first to, to whatever uh, Danish password I could come up with, my uh, four red castles with a horse or whatever it might be. It doesn't really matter as long as you can remember it when you deliver it to them and then change it back when that session is over. Uh, as long as you keep the backup way of recovering it, yours. Right? It, it's, if, if the only way to truly take ownership of whatever account you're giving credentials out to is your email address or mm -hmm. your email account for that matter, or those three questions or whatever it might be, right. um, they, they can't take it just because they've gotten that password you changed a moment ago. Um, but yeah, yeah, there's no, yeah, but, which ties there. into the last point of using two factor authentication and don't, you know, you leave when I did this with my virtual assistant in the Philippines, she would, she would log in and have to say like, Hey, you know, it's asking, can you, can you okay me? And so I'd go to my phone and hit, yeah, that's, it's okay. Um, but she, I wouldn't let her have that access. Right. Cause then she could do whatever, whenever. Right. So it's, it's, a, if, if that's possible, um, make sure you can do that. Now, the other thing, um, this, of course, is heavily dependent on what you're doing, but with a lot of web page stuff, you can see, like, let's say with Facebook, you can you can go in and see what browsers are logged in, right, and, and log everybody out. So after everything's done, see if there's a way to go and say, 
you know what, boot me out of everything that this thing's logged into and I'll manually log in with my new credentials to your point, Jackie. Um, and it's just, you know, you feel a little better now uh, that you're safe. So I think these are some really good, it doesn't fully limit you in your risk, but it helps reduce it a significant amount. Yeah, absolutely. Totally agree. Cool. Well, I hope you guys all enjoyed that. I thought that was a really solid, and it's something that, interesting enough, isn't really discussed in many places, like on the forum. So this, this to me, was a really important podcast. I'm glad we did it. Yeah, uh, me too. Absolutely. If, if any of you guys have ideas of other things, like please add comments and tell us things that, that you do to protect yourself and to minimize risk. Yeah, we, we try to take up topics that we think are relevant. So, yeah, absolutely. If you have something, it's most likely relevant. So, yeah. Bye, man. See you next week. Yeah, bye. We love reading your comments, that's for sure. So let us hear what you think. We love those likes, and please do share. If you enjoyed that episode of the Automators Podcast, you might also like this one. Hey, today we're going to cover why macros ain't popular anymore. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this one. Yeah, it's going to be great. So if you enjoyed listening to that, make sure you head to pod.v-automator.com and take a look for it.